Hello, my name is Arnaud Delorme. When I started EEG research, I struggled with the best way to conduct an uh, EEG experiment, and it took me years to do it right. I learned by making mistakes and often wasted months of work. Based on my experience, these are 16 advices for junior researchers for designing and conducting EEG experiments. The first advice is about reviewing the literature. This one is obvious. Uh, you may have an idea and just want to perform a quick experiment to test that idea. Unfortunately, when the time comes to draft your report or article, you will have to review the literature to replace your experiment in its context. You then realize that someone else has already done the same experiment or done a similar one. Or you might discover that in light of the literature, uh, you should have done your experiment differently. So it's always better to review the literature before you start. In my team, most PhD students begin their thesis by writing a review article on their dissertation topic to understand the context in which they will work and perform experiments. The second advice is about planning. You think planning is a waste of time. You simply want to program the experiment and start collecting data and see what happens in the brain. You think you'll figure out how to analyze the data later. More often than not, it doesn't go well. After collecting data on a few participants, you realize there's a bug in your stimulus presentation program or that you've made a conceptual mistake in the randomization procedure. Or you might realize that you've made mistakes only when the times come to analyze the data and publish the article. You should plan as much as possible. The third advice is to make sure you understand that collecting EEG data is different than running psychophysics experiments and adding EEG. Maybe you're an expert in experimental psychology, where participants perform psychophysics tasks or play games on computer screens. You may, have, you may think that you can simply add EEG to your psychophysics experiments and figure out what happens in the brain. In 95% of the case, that's not going to work. The first reason is controlling movements. If participants move, the EEG signal will be run by muscle artifacts, which are order of magnitudes larger than brain signals. And of course, there are exceptions. There are researchers who specialize in collecting EEG data during movements. However, this is not the place to start. Even if the participant is not moving their body or their head, moving their eyes can be enough to render the EEG signal unusable. It is why in EEG experiments, we ask people to fixate the center of the screen and place a fixation cross for them to focus on. Here are some extreme cases of trying to limit movements. You could use a chin rest. I've even seen a paper where the experimenters give participants small dose of curare to limit muscle contractions. I would not advise to do that, but it illustrates the extreme methods people sometimes uh, use to minimize muscle artifacts. Also, when collecting EEG data, because the EEG signal is noisy, you need to multiple repetitions of the same condition. When collecting brain response to experimental stimuli, the rule of thumb is to present each stimulus at least 30 times, and in general, it's better to present them at least 100 times. The fourth advice is not to be too ambitious. You might want to do a complex experiment and answer a variety of hypotheses. Uh, the experiment lasts several hours, contain multiple tasks and a dozen of questionnaire to collect psychometric data that you're planning to correlate with EEG activity. You decide to collect EEG, heart data and eye movements. Not only is it challenging to set up this type of complex experiment, but then you might get lost in the amount of data and the type of analysis you can do. Uh, I've been there. Uh, eventually, you will likely focus on testing one hypothesis and ignore 50% of the data. So it might actually be better to perform simpler experiments. Simpler is often better. However, it's also possible to have complex data and answer simple questions. For example, here you can have a participant uh, 
in a natural environment with eye tracking and facing forward cameras so we know what the what object the participant is looking at so the data is very rich and complex but we can still ask precise questions for example we can look at the brain response to faces versus non-faces so complex setup is okay as long as you have limited and realistic goals the fifth advice is to make sure you properly randomize your data Failing to balance participants in different groups and uh, randomizing trials properly is probably one of the most common uh, mistakes in EEG research. For example, participants could learn to anticipate which type of trials is coming if you do not randomize your trials properly. Or if you present the same type of trial in blocks as you would do for fMRI, this could bias your results. Uh, this article showed that most machine learning approach on block design EEG data is worthless because stimuli of the same types are shown in sequence and not in randomized order. The sixth advice is to remember to do power calculation. In general, when performing experiments, you want to make inferences on a target population, such as uh, human adults, for example. The number of participants in your experiment depends on several factors such as your threshold for significance, how many variables in your design, the number of hypotheses you're testing, uh, and the amplitude of the effect you expect. Based on this information, you can use tools to calculate the minimum number of participants you need. I included one such tool in the description. In general, you will end up with 16 to 32 participants but it's always good to do your due diligence and you may use this information in the method of your paper to justify the number of participants. For example, a common mistake is to have too many factors in your design and not enough participants. For example, when presenting visual stimuli, you might want to test how the shape, the color, the depth, the transparency, the texture, background, brightness, contrast, etc. influence cognition and the interaction between all these factors. This is asking a lot of questions at once and require more participants in your experiment. The seventh advice is to ask for ethical approval. One reason to obtain ethical approval is that most journals require it for publication. Obtaining ethical approval means submitting a document to your research institute or a private entity specializing in these matters. In this document, You'll describe the experiment, how you will obtain informed consent from participants, and preserve their privacy and rights. It also involves anonymizing the data. I personally advise to only store identifiable data on the consent form that the subject sign, and assign a subject code at this stage. Then these consent forms can be stored physically or digitally in a secure location, but uh, not with the data, of course. The eighth advice is to pre-register your experiment. Pre-registering an experiment is different than asking for ethical approval, although the documents are similar. Pre-registration means that you're going to describe the method you're using, how you're going to analyze the data and report your results, even before you have started collecting the data. The main reason to pre-register is to improve scientific rigor and avoid reporting false positive results. When you're not pre-registering your experiment, you may end up performing different analysis than the one you had originally planned. You can still do that when you pre-register, but at least it's made explicit. The problem with exploratory analysis is that if you do many of them, one might turn out to be significant just by chance. Unfortunately, unfortunately this is a common practice, and the main reason is that journals tend uh, to favor positive and exceptional results. A large number of researchers analyze their data using different angles and then write the paper that makes the most sense based on their result. The system uh, rewards this behavior. To resist the temptation, you can pre-register your experiment. The other advantage of pre-registering your experiment is that it will force you to think deeply on how you will analyze your data. Often you, it will lead you to do minor adjustments in your experimental design change stimulus presentation latencies, the randomization procedure, or make sure you have all the demographic information from your participants. Some journals, for example, uh, 
have a new model where you publish a first paper with your method, uh, then collect data and publish the results in the second paper. Uh, PLOS One just started this model. The ninth advice is to program the experiment yourself or at least check the code even though you might not be a programmer. There are a lot of details that go into designing an experiment. You want to make sure the randomization is properly implemented and that there is no unwanted buffer delays. For programming experiments, I personally advise using the Psychophysics Toolbox, which is free and open source. It has a large user base and you might be able to find people to help you by asking questions on forums. The tenth advice is not to trust your equipment or your software too much. EEG and psychophysics are niche markets. Uh, there might be a couple of hundred researchers using the same EEG hardware as you are. Given that there are bugs in commercial software packages used by millions of people, you can imagine what it might be for software used by hundreds of people. I recommend using open source software packages because many other researchers have already looked at the code and checked that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And of course, you should check yourself. Uh, in particular, for EEG data acquisition, I recommend testing the synchronization of the EEG equipment with uh, stimulus, stimulus presentation and event markers. In event-related EEG, ideally, we need one millisecond precision for all these events. Although in practice, we rarely get more than a few millisecond precision. Uh, problems most often occur in two places. One is the synchronization of the event markers with the EEG acquisition. There might be a delay or a jitter you're not controlling for. Uh, and the second most common problem is synchronization of the stimulus presentation with the event markers because of various audio or video buffers or simply because uh, you've, uh, of the way you've written your experimental script. For video, for example, most screen refresh rate is 60 Hertz, uh, which means one frame every 17 milliseconds, which is quite slow by EEG standard. It's better to use screens with higher refresh rates and also check that the image is shown all at once on the screen, uh, and that might not be the case for LCD screens. Testing equipment synchronization means using an oscilloscope, microphones, and photodiodes to compare actual stimulus uh, latencies on the screen versus event markers uh, latencies. Every EEG and psychophysics researcher uh, goes through this painful process at least once. I put some links in the description for more detail. The 11th advice is to scan your EEG electrode position and when possible, uh, collect anatomical MRIs for EEG source localization. Of course, First, you want to select an EEG cap of the right size for the participant and position your EEG cap properly. Then scanning electrode is simpler than it sounds. You need an iPad Air equipped with a special 3D camera. Scanning takes about uh, 30 seconds. Then all the software to extract electrode position from the 3D model uh, is available open source. When you have the electrode position, you can perform better alignment between the caps of different individuals. Acquiring MRIs is also a great way to up your game in EEG analysis. Acquiring anatomical MRIs takes about 15 minutes per participant, so it is a minor added time, especially if you have an MRI close by. Of course, if your participants already have MRIs acquired for a previous experiment, you can reuse them. Once you have the MRI and scan electrode positions, there are pipeline to perform uh, source localization. This can greatly improve the quality of your EEG source analysis and it is definitely something to consider even if you're not planning to do it as a primary analysis. The twelfth advice is to acquire pilot data. Even if you're planning your experiments ex exceptionally well, there are problems you will only encounter when you start collecting data. It is impossible to think of everything, so you want to record at least one pilot participant, which is a participant that you're not going to process. Uh, you cannot only figure out what uh, goes wrong, but you can also get feedback from the participant. This is a recent pilot flight from SpaceX that went wrong. Uh, 
but this was part of eventually uh, making it right. The 13th advice is to check data quality and properly optimize the EEG signal. As we commonly say, garbage in, garbage out. Optimizing the EEG signal means, of course, checking the electrode impedance. If you cannot check electrode impedance, check by eye that the signal from each electrode is acceptable. You should give special attention to the reference electrode. Try tweaking the bad electrodes until the signal is acceptable. Getting rid of artifacts or bad electrodes will be more than twice the work when you process the data. You should also check uh, for equipment in the room that can generate electrical noise, such as air conditioning, large backup batteries, light sources or electrical outlets. EMF meter uh, might help you to find electromagnetic fields that can contaminate the signal. It is not necessary to have uh, an electromagnetic shielded room, but uh, you must still try to minimize external noise sources. Everybody has their own trick. What I personally like to do is to turn off the electricity completely, use a battery powered EEG system, and run my experiment from a battery powered laptop with the uh, participant not having direct contact with the recording or presentation equipment. Other people uh, use other tricks. Uh, recording colder temperatures also help, as shown in this graph here. Temperature above 26 degrees centigrade and high air humidity degrades the EEG signal, especially when electrodes impedances are, are high. I put a link to the paper in the description. The 14th advice is to take notes when collecting data. You are now collecting data, but some things can go wrong even when you've planned everything. So it's good to have a notebook where you can write whatever happens. For example, you might have swapped EEG electrodes by mistakes or the participant was scratching his head. Make sure you write the participant ID on your notes. And once you're done collecting data, you can take a picture with your phone and save the picture along with your data so it's easy to find. The 15th advice is about organizing data once you've collected it. How do you save your data? Instead of using a random file naming convention uh, you might have come up with, I strongly advise that you use BIDS, the Brain Imaging Data Structure, where files and folders are named based on uh, participant ID, session, block numbers, task name, etc. BIDS make sure that you're using the same prefix for all the files of a given participant. And the other advantage is that if your data is formatted in BIDS, you can directly apply pre-processing pipelines. If your data is properly anonymized using bids when you acquire it, you can make a copy on the cloud so it can easily be backed up and shared with others. I made a video on bids and EEG Lab automated processing pipelines, which I put in the description. My final advice is not to change the experiments before you finish collecting data. That's kind of obvious, but we've all done it at least once. For example, you realize that some participants have a hard time seeing a briefly flash visual stimulus and you want to increase the size as shown here. It's just a minor change and you think it's not going to have a dramatic impact on the EEG, but you might be wrong. Uh, I would strongly advise against doing that, even if you think uh, you're planning to consider this change as a factor in your experimental design. And of course, you also don't want to stop the experiment early because you've already started to analyze the data and realize that you have enough participants to reach a, signif a significant effect. This is called optional stopping and this is uh, dishonest science. Because you perform multiple statistical tests, one after each participant, one of these tests could turn out to be significant just by chance. So these were 16 advice uh, for collecting EEG data, uh, good brain hacking.